I hope everybody had a good fourth. And so if you have your Bibles this morning, and I hope that you do, I want to encourage you to turn back with me to Malachi chapter 2. Malachi chapter 2. We're going to be reading four verses there, starting in verse 13. One of the things, if you are our guest, I want to say a special word of thank you or welcome to you and thank you for being here with us uh, this morning. Uh, one of the things that we do here, our, one of our regular diet of preaching is going to be preaching through books of the Bible. And so uh, we do that uh, for very specific reasons because number one, it, it helps us hear what God has said in his word. God thought it was important to put here. We need to know God's thoughts, not just our own. And secondly, one of the things that it does, one of the benefits that it has is Sometimes it will bring up difficult topics that we just can't steer around because we're preaching verse by verse through this. We've got to hit that head on, and today would be one of those days, a difficult topic, but I think an important topic, and we need to know God's thoughts on this. Stand with me, if you will, if you have that. And so Malachi chapter 2, starting in verse 13. If you don't have a Bible, you can read along off the screen with us. You read along silently. I'll read along aloud. Malachi chapter 2, starting in verse 13. This is another thing you do. You cover the altar of the Lord with tears, with weeping, and with groaning, because he no longer regards the offering or accepts it from, with favor from your hand. Yet you say, for what reason? Because the Lord has been a witness between you and the wife of your youth against whom you have dealt treacherously, though she is your companion and your wife by covenant. But no one has done so who has a remnant of the Spirit. And what did that one do while he was seeking godly offspring? Take heed then to your spirit and let no one deal treacherously against the wife of his youth. For I hate divorce says the Lord God of Israel, and him who covers his garment with wrong, says, uh, says the Lord of hosts. So take heed to your spirit so that you do not deal treacherously. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We ask that you would teach us this morning through your word how to love our spouses faithfully and how to encourage those who have been through the difficulty of divorce. And we ask for this in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. So divorce is that hard topic. And it's not an easy topic to talk about. It affects literally hundreds of millions of people in the United States alone. And it's not just the two people that were married and now separate. It's their children. It's their families and extended families that are hurt. It's friends that are hurt. It's church families and the society around as well that feels these effects. Divorce hurts. Last November, Time Magazine cited a Bowling Green University study that noted that divorce rates this past year were the lowest in nearly 40 years. Yet even in light of these dropping rates, the American Psychological Association states that still 40 to 50 percent of married people divorce. That is nearly half the married people in America. And lest we think, well, we're in Oklahoma. This, this is the buckle of the Bible belt here. You know, we don't need to worry about this here. That's not really a problem here. I mean, maybe off in like New York or something, maybe they have that problem there, but we don't here. Actually, that same Bowling Green study, Bowling Green University study, noted the states, including D.C., that had the highest rate of divorce. And we were sixth. The sixth highest divorce rate in the nation. If you take out D.C., we're five. It's happening here. And you know it, and I know it. What does God say about this? And this is what is so helpful about this passage. As we read last week, last week's message and this week's coupled together really, really well, we found out that the, these men in Judah were marrying wives that uh, were uh, idol worshipers. And this week we're finding out, what are they doing? Well, they're divorcing their faithful Jewish wives. 
So it doesn't really take a whole lot of working to figure out what's going on there. They've been married for a while. She's getting older. This newer model this year looks better, and we'll just go with this one. It's probably what's happening. That, that doesn't sound like ancient history at all, does it? That sounds extremely contemporary. That, that sounds like the kind of betrayal in marriage that happens even today. And in this passage, God told Judah to remain faithful to their wives. And through this passage, God tells us that we, as Christians, are to love and honor our spouses because of God's faithful love to us. We are to love and honor our spouses because of God's faithful love to us. Three things that we're going to learn from this passage here today. The first one is that God defends marriage. The second one is that God, God's plan is marriage, and he has a plan for marriage. Marriage is God's plan. The third one, God hates divorce. Let's take a look at these. Chapter 2, verse 13, God defends marriage. You see here in this verse that God talks about their weeping and groaning, their tears over their offerings because God no longer accepts them or regards them with favor. So if I can put that in today's society, they're still offering offerings to the Lord. They're wanting to worship their idols and follow God. And so God says, no, we're not having any part of that. Not only is that idol worship, but you, as it says here, are betraying your very own wives, which brings up this very clear principle, and that's this, that the way we treat our wives can affect our relationship with the Lord. The way we treat our husbands can affect our relationship with the Lord. We do not get to treat our spouse just any way we want to treat them. In fact, in this situation where the men had been betraying their wives... God says, I'm not even going to accept your worship anymore. Go ahead, cry. Weep. I'm not listening. I don't care. If you are going to betray your wives and betray me by worshiping these idols, I'm not going to listen here. One of the things that we learn from this passage is simply this. That emotional worship itself is not a bad thing. But emotional worship without obedience is hypocritical worship. Oh, that was such a moving service today. Did it lead to, wor- did it lead to obedience? If not, it's, it's not real worship. It's hypocritical worship. These men were emotionally moved. Apparently, they wanted God's blessing. Weeping, groaning, asking the Lord to bless Emotional worship that does not lead to obedience is hypocritical worship. But I want you to notice specifically how God is acting in this situation. Verse 14, yet you say, for what reason? Why? Why has God not accepted these offerings? Notice his answer, because the Lord has been a witness between you and the wife of your youth. That word witness there is actually a very technical term. The God is acting as a covenant witness to that situation. I love weddings. And one of the blessings that I get to, uh, one of the blessings of being a pastor is that I get to be here closer than anybody else to the groom and to the bride when they say I do. Now, I have always loved weddings. If that makes me a weird guy, then I'm a weird guy, and that's totally cool. You all already know I'm weird, so we're fine with that, okay? We're fine. I love this. There's something beautiful about these two people committing their lives to one another. But there's other players in this scene, not as important as the bride and the groom, but they do have a place. You have the best man just over here. You have the maid of honor over here, or possibly the matron of honor if she's married over here, and they do more than hold the rings. They have a job. In fact, afterwards, they are the people that most often are asked to sign the marriage license as witnesses. They are witnesses that, yes, indeed, this took place. I have to sign it, say, I married these people. They are the ones that witness that, yes, this marriage does take place. You look at your marriage license. If you're married, you will see the names probably of those two people that were there with you. 
Now, when God says he's a covenant witness, he means that and more. He means more than just, hey, I saw this and I saw you said I do. So don't tell anybody that you didn't say I do because I saw it. I know that you did. He's saying more than that. A covenant witness in the Old Testament not only verified that a covenant had been made, and that's what's happening here, a covenant between these two people. A covenant witness also had the responsibility to enforce and make sure both sides were keeping their part of the covenant. And if they weren't, he was the one that was supposed to come in and draw that out and say, hey, you're not doing what you said you would do. You aren't being committed in this situation to your wife. You said you were going to. You are breaking that covenant. This is what a covenant witness does. I want you to notice the role that God is playing in this situation. He is playing defender for these wives. Bethel Baptist Church, one of the things that we have done as evangelicals where we have fallen down is we've kind of sidelined everybody that's been through divorce. We absolutely have sometimes. I had a friend of mine that uh, had been through a divorce and uh, he hated it and, and just, uh, I found it really interesting that most people who have been through a divorce are the people who hate divorce the most. Uh, I think that's really interesting because they know the heartache that goes with this. They know the heartache here. There are some divorces where one spouse is absolutely betrayed. The Bible speaks of these as valid reasons for divorce. Infidelity, your spouse is sleeping around. Abandonment, one of the spouse just says, I'm out, I'm leaving. In those situations, we do not hold the wronged spouse responsible. Realizing that nobody's perfect in any marriage, we understand there are difficulties, but we also understand here in this situation, God is acting on behalf of the one who is wronged. We should love and receive those who are wronged. My friend that I told you about, he had been through this. He hated divorce and he hated his own divorce. He said it's hard to actually come to churches though, in all honesty, because he almost feels like he has to come into the church and as he enters the doors, shout, unclean, unclean. Oh, you're divorced. Oh, okay. You sit over there in the corner. You're damaged goods. And that's not the picture that we see here today. That is not the picture that we see here. We see God defending this one who is, these ladies who have been betrayed by their husbands. Now, I don't want to get into a, a, you know, war here over, oh, no, this person was right in the marriage. Oh, no, that person was right in the marriage. No, we don't, we don't want to do that. We don't want to create that kind of a situation, but we do need to recognize there are situations where a spouse is being betrayed and where we need to love and surround that spouse, the one who is betrayed. And we need to call the one who is doing the betraying back to faithfulness. Sometimes they will not respond. We, that's you, that's me, have a responsibility to love each other faithfully in this. Believer, do you realize that God will hold you accountable for how you have loved your spouse? We don't get to treat our spouse however we want. That's the principle of this passage here. God will hold you accountable. Even as his word in our New Testament reading today said um, that every careless word that you say, he will hold you accountable for. He will hold you accountable for how you treat your spouse, even to how you speak to your spouse disobedience in this area can absolutely affect worship in this area. So that we come here week after week giving our tithes and offerings, being involved, becoming to Sunday school, but things just aren't working. Why? Well, because we're not being obedient in loving our spouse. We are called to love our Spouses. Why? Well, because marriage is God's plan, which is our second point. I want to turn your attention to verse 14. Back to verse 14. Marriage is God's plan. Why, God? Why did you do this? For what reason? The Lord said, because I've been a witness between you and the wife of your youth against whom you have dealt treacherously, though she is your companion and your wife by covenant. There are three phrases that the Lord uses here to describe the wives of these men that they've betrayed. Three different phrases. First of all, the wife of your youth, which probably enforces the idea that 
they got married when they were younger, she's now older, and they're marrying younger women right now. Probably points to that, that this is the sin going on here. The second word that it uses there is companion. This is actually, the Hebrew word here is a, related to a, a, a construction term. The, the companion or partner, the, the picture was taking two pieces and putting them together like a, a joint in the house or a seam in the wall. And the idea was that they were, these two were going to be put together and affixed in such a way that they were permanently together. You don't want joints and seams coming apart in your house. That's bad. That's not going to be a safe place to live. The picture of this word companion is people that God has joined together here, affixed together. It is a permanent relationship that he has created. And then he says that this is your wife by covenant. We don't often think of covenants today. In fact, most of the time, the only place we talk about covenants are here in church. We talk about contracts a lot. A marriage covenant is not a contract, and so here's the difference. Here's the picture. Contract. If you will, then I will, but if you don't, then I won't. So I hire somebody to fix my windows. If they come fix my windows, I pay them. If they don't come and fix my windows, I don't pay them. All bets are off. But this is not how marriage works. I love you if you do the things that I want you to do. But if you don't do the things I want you to do, I don't need to worry about loving you anymore. That is not the way marriage works. In fact, that is very anti the way God has set up marriage. Marriage is meant as a covenant. And so here's what takes place. Back up here a little bit. I get to stand here, husband here, wife here, or groom here, bride here. They're not husband and wife yet, pardon me. And so they, uh, uh, they get to share their vows with one another. At this point, notice there are no if-then statements. There aren't, okay? So to quote Pastor Matt Chandler down in, uh, down in Texas, at this point, they don't get to say, well, honey, I will take you if you will do the dishes every single night. All right, well, I'll love you as long as you continue to work and bring home money and don't be a lazy rear end that sits on the couch the whole time. All right, woman. <laughs> then I, if you will, okay, nobody, when that happens, is tearing up going, oh my gosh. <laughs> this is so beautiful. I just, no, more than likely, like Matt Chandler, we're, we're like going, I'm getting my, my, I'm taking my gift back, I'm taking it off the table, we're leaving. I'm not even finishing the ceremony here. Something is desperately wrong, because here's the picture of what's supposed to take place. I am going to love you, and I'm committing myself to love you no matter what. In response, the wife, the bride, I am will love you. No if then. Free, complete commitment of ourselves to love one another. This is a blessing, even when it's hard. Now, if you're married and you're like, even when it's hard, marriage isn't hard. Marriage is lovely and easy. It's the wonder, most wonderful thing in the face of the earth. You have obviously just gotten married. And bless you. Bless you. Marriage is wonderful. Marriage is a blessing. And it is not all hard, but there are times when it is hard. And one of the things that makes marriage a blessing is that even when it's hard, we're not saying, hey, you better fix this or I'm jumping ship. You better get things worked out or I'm out of here. No. We continue to stay committed to one another, even when things go bad, even when we have to say, you know what, I love you, but you are just not my best friend in the world right now. <laughs> and if you're married, you've been there. That happens. And you know what? We love each other through those things. We get beyond those things, and we continue to love one another. This leads to a very important conclusion that we need to draw here. Marriage is about more than just our moment-by-moment moment happiness. I've heard this a lot. I'm just so happy around them. Well, that's, that's a good thing. It's good to be happy around one another. 
It really is. But sometimes, sometimes it's hard to be around one another. Sometimes it's difficult. But we've committed ourselves to love one another. This is what that covenant does. If somebody doesn't do what we want or makes a mistake or you know, doesn't do everything that we think they should be doing, we don't get to say, okay, you're not fulfilling your end, I'm out. No, you have freely committed yourself to that person to love them. This is the way this works. Now, I want to back up here very clearly and, 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 and say what I'm not saying here. What I'm not saying is, even if your life is horrible and you all hate each other's guts, just remain living in the same house and don't get divorced. No, no, no. You are called to love one another. This is not a forced oneness, as we're going to find out here in just a moment. This is what God has done in making us one. He has called us to genuinely, truly love and be together, be one that he has created us. It is not to simply just put up with one another. Although sometimes that does take place. He calls us to love one another. And that love is a commitment. That love is a, I'm going to seek your best in light of eternity. I'm going to place such a high value upon you that I'm going to seek what is best for you, not what's best for me but best for you. This is what he calls for when he tells them, you are betraying the wife of your covenant. Look at verse 15. Verse 15 is one of the most hardest verses to understand in the Old Testament. It's very difficult to translate. If you have an ESV or ESV translation, the ESV translation absolutely, I believe, nails it. Here's the ESV translation of verse 15. Did he not, that's God, did God not make them one? with a portion of his spirit in their union. And what was God seeking? Godly offspring. So this, this reminds us of something. This reminds us of Genesis chapter 2 and what God does when people are married. For this reason, Genesis 2 tells us, a man shall leave his father and his mother, and shall cling to his wife, and those two shall become one flesh. They will be one. Marriage has always been God's plan that he takes these two and molds and intertwines and intermingles their lives till they are connected. We're still individuals. There's still things we disagree on, but our lives are interconnected and intertwined now. By the way, this is why divorce hurts so much, because we rip apart what God has carefully intertwined together, even if we didn't think that we were intertwined. He did this in us when we committed ourselves to one another. He has made us one. He has called us to love our spouse. He is calling us to this. When it says he makes them one, this is not merely a poetic statement, but a statement of reality, of what God has done for us and what God has done in us. We are one relationally. Nobody else has that relationship like you and your wife have, and nobody else should have that kind of a relationship with you. You are one emotionally. Nobody should share those emotions and feelings with each other, with you, like you do with your wife or your husband. You should share those things. You are one physically. Sex is not all of marriage, but it is a part of marriage. And this is the place where he, God says, be blessed with one another. And that's why the breaking of that is so betraying. Because this is meant for this specific relationship. He made you one as a family. The two of you, when you were first married, you even still were a new family. And then as you had children, that family grew. And as they moved off, you are still a family. And maybe your great-grandchildren are now done having children. You and your spouse are still a family. God has made you one. This is a blessing to one another. A blessing to your children. Because that's one of the things that God was doing here. Creating godly offspring. So that you are following Christ. And you are following Christ individually and together. And leading your children to follow Christ. So that they see this picture of a marriage that follows Christ. So that they will have children. And teach them to follow Christ. And have the marriages that follow Christ. This is the picture. Ongoing. This was always God's plan. 
God's plan was for per, uh, marriage to be a permanent commitment in a loving relationship that he creates, that he blesses, that produces godly offspring. It's not a forced love or an undesired oneness, but a lifelong loving relationship and commitment to one another. And the problem with divorce is it completely guts this, cuts it open and rips the guts out of it. God hates divorce for this reason. He doesn't hate divorced people. I want to make that very, very clear. If you've been through divorce, you know how much that hurts. God doesn't hate you. God hates this act of divorce because of what it does. And you probably know better than most people in this room, better even than me, how much it hurts and why he hates it. He loves you. I want you to notice real quickly with me why God hates divorce. Notice it says here in verse 16 that God hates divorce. And him who covers his garment with wrong. The picture of that, that's an Old Testament saying, basically. The picture of that in this saying where these husbands are betraying their wives. These husbands are saying, I'm, I'm not going to love you anymore. Thanks, but yeah, whatever. I'm going to go love this one over here now. That this is a picture of one covering himself in wrongdoing, covering himself in uh, violence, as some translation have. What that picture is this. Somebody dressing up in very nice clothes, going out and brutally murdering somebody, being covered in their blood, and then happily walking around in their blood. That's gross and disgusting. And it's meant to be. This is what they're doing. They are brutally severing this relationship with their wives. They are covered in the blood of that brutal separation and thinking, oh yeah, everything's great, everything's fine. No, you have done something awful to your wife. God hates divorce. So take heed to your spirit. God says this twice to the people. We can put that in just regular English today. Take care of your marriage. How? How do we take care of our marriage? Six things real quickly and we're going to finish. Number one, follow Christ. Follow Christ because, as we said a few weeks ago, marriage is a picture. Marriage is not the original. Marriage is the copy. And Christ and his church is the original. And so what we see in Ephesians 5 when we take a look there is Christ is the faithful spouse who loves his bride, the church, faithfully. He doesn't let us go. He came here and died on the cross for our sins, not so we could go earn that from him, but he could give that love to us freely as a gift to whoever wants it. And if you're here today and you've never received the gift of eternal life with Jesus Christ, forgiveness for your sin, I want to encourage you to trust in Jesus Christ today. He died on the cross for your sins, rose again the third day so that you could be made completely right with God because one way or another, your sins will have to be paid for. And there are two ways they will be paid for. Either you can trust them to Christ, trust Him for forgiveness, trust Him as Lord, and have those completely forgiven and wiped out, or you can spend an eternity separated from God in a living place called hell. I'm not trying to scare anybody. I'm simply trying to be faithful to what the word of God tells us. Christ is the faithful husband who will hold on to you. He is the faithful one who's not going to say, you know what, I'm getting tired of you now. So I'm going to take these other people on instead of you. I'm going to just drop you and I'll be with these people now. He's not going to do that. He's going to be faithful. He's going to hold on to you. He's going to take care of you. He's going to love you. He's not going to let you go. And we can cling to him. He is the reason we can love our spouse as well. He is the reason we can love each other in this church well. Why? Because he's faithful and he faithfully continues to love us even though we understand more day by day how messed up by sin we are. He already knew that and chose to come here for us anyway. That should fill us with rejoicing that he loves us and holds on to us by covenant like this. 
He nourishes and cherishes his body. He cherishes you. If you are a believer today, and simply because we're talking about divorce, I want to make this very, very clear. If you're a believer, if you, even if you've gone through this travesty, this divorce, he cherishes you. He loves you. Cling to him, the one who can restore. Well, pastor, there's no way my, my marriage is getting restored. I understand. Sometimes that's the case. He can still restore you. Second thing, we need to love and honor our spouse. Husbands, we're called to love our spouse, put her first, treat her as a precious vessel. Wives, you are called to honor and respect your husbands. These are the things that we're called to give to one another. Plants grow in the right environment with the right cup of fertilizer and the right water. Marriages grow as we put Christ first and we continue to love and respect one another. They do. Follow Christ, love and respect. Following Christ, love and respect. And we will bloom and flourish. Remember that we are one flesh with one another. And that's, again, more than just sex. It's a portion of it. But we're also called to be one, which means we need to communicate. And maybe you're at that time in life where that's hard because you get up at 6 because that's what time your kids get up. And they go to bed at 8.30 and you just crash at 8.31. And I get that, okay? I understand that. You still need to communicate with your spouse. The most important relationship you have is not with work, it's not with your children, it's not with other family members, it's not with friends, it's not with sports. It's with your spouse, the one you have been made one with. So be committed to one another. And don't neglect one another, even in the physical area. 1 Corinthians tells us this, don't neglect each other in this area. Take care of one another. Four, praise your spouse. Men, Proverbs 31 tells us that husband praises his wife. Ladies, Ephesians 5 tells you to honor and respect your husband. Praise your spouse verbally. That helps. It it helps to hear those things that you're appreciated and why. Fifthly, pray with your spouse. This is the one that you've been made one with. Who else is going to pray for your marriage? Who else is going to pray for your spouse? Who else has that kind of a relationship where they know what they need? You can pray for your spouse like nobody else can, with an effectiveness that nobody else can. Pray for your spouse and pray for your own heart that you would be committed more and more to your spouse. And then finally, just beware improperly motivated connections and relationships with others. Beware of those things that come in and try and sap that emotional energy for your spouse because you're giving it to this person. And maybe it seems innocuous, but maybe it's not. Beware those lusts. Beware those improper relationships. God calls us to love our spouse faithfully because he loves us faithfully. And our marriages are meant to be a picture that continues to display Christ in his church to the glory of God to everyone else. How do you need to love your spouse today? How can you love and honor your spouse today? Do you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? We're coming to our time of response, and it's during this time that we set aside time to respond to him. If you do not know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, the word of God tells us, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I want to encourage you to call on him. I'm going to be down front here in just a moment. Mark will be down front. If you want to ask somebody questions about that, I want to encourage you to ask. If you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, but you've never followed in baptism like we saw this morning, I want to encourage you to come forward saying, I've trusted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I need to follow in obedience to baptism. It doesn't save you, but it is the first step of obedience. I want to encourage you to follow him. But perhaps you're already a church member. Perhaps you know Jesus Christ and you've been baptized. How do you need to love your spouse in light of what God has said today? Let's pray and we'll respond. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your great love for us in your son.